In early 1942, the Pacific Theater was dominated by the Empire of the Rising Sun. The Japanese flag now flew over much of the former British territories in the region, and by February, Japanese aircraft carriers had steamed into the Timor Sea and begun launching air raids upon the Queen's holdings in Australia. Understandably, the Australian military was desperately scrambling to get its hands on armored vehicles of any shape and size. Unfortunately, local designs had barely even reached the prototype stage, hampering Australia's lofty goal of fielding a full armored division by the end of the year. But before we continue, we'd like to shout out to our friends from the Military History Group who are publishing their first book about the IS-2, written by Peter Samsonov. The IS-2 is the quintessential Soviet heavy tank from the late stages of World War II, being heavily armored and boasting a fearsome 122mm gun. The tank's history is told from the beginning of the Soviet heavy tank program until the end of World War II, in the most detailed and complete account of its development, design, and production available in English. Supported by extensive research in Russian language sources, this publication includes a comprehensive breakdown of prototypes, the Soviet analysis of weaknesses in German tanks, including the Tiger and Panther, the development of the 122mm gun, the principles of the new tank's armor layout, and a wealth of technical data. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, check out our description for a link where you can buy it. However, in mid-1942, salvation arrived in the form of 200 Matilda II tanks delivered by the British Empire after the design had become obsolete thanks to the introduction of the cheaper Valentine Mark III. The bad news was that the vehicles did not come with spare parts, and over half were promptly cannibalized to maintain the remainder of the fleet. The stock Ordnance quick-firing two-pounder guns were also deemed inadequate for jungle warfare, and so a deal was struck with New Zealand to exchange some of their tanks for ones fitted with three-inch howitzers. Around 400 Matilda IIs would serve in the Australian Armed Forces throughout the war. Matildas in Australian service were functionally identical to their European counterparts upon arrival, though many were later modified to suit the needs of the Pacific Theater. With four crew members and a gross weight of 25 and a half tons, this classic example of a British medium infantry tank could chug along at 15 miles per hour and was powered by two Leyland A148 and E149 straight six-cylinder water-cooled diesel engines, totaling about 190 horsepower. The cast hull armor averaged between 15 and 78 millimeters thick, while the turret was 75 millimeters thick all around. The Matilda II was such a game changer to the Australian war effort that great lengths were taken to conceal them until they can thunder into action. On the 20th of October, 1943, the Tanks of Sea Squadron 1st Tank Battalion made landfall at Langmok Bay on the Huon Peninsula to help liberate Papua New Guinea. After weeks of careful preparation and tightened security measures, nine tanks deployed in support of the 26th Infantry Battalion as they advanced towards Saddleburg but the rough terrain immediately necessitated support from combat engineers, forcing the infantry to crawl forward in small companies alongside one or two tanks each. Although only 450 yards of ground were covered in the first 24 hours, the Matildas flushed out numerous Japanese ambushes with a combination of machine gun fire and high explosive shells. The durability of the Matilda II was proven conclusively on the 2nd of December 1943, when one tank trundled forward to rescue an infantry unit pinned down by enemy fire. At less than 50 yards, a concealed Japanese 37mm AT gun opened fire on the vehicle, while a swarm of Japanese soldiers began hurling grenades and mines at it from the cover of a nearby ditch. As the tank tried to maneuver and depress its guns to engage attackers, it was immobilized by several direct hits from a 75mm howitzer, damaging the frontal track idlers and suspension. Left without options, the crew were forced to bail out through the emergency escape hatch under the tank and crawl back to Allied lines, leaving the stricken vehicle to endure 50 direct hits from various projectiles and explosives. Unbelievably, not a single hit caused any real damage, and after the position was retaken, the battered Matilda II was driven away under its own power and returned right into action on December 4th. However, although the Matilda II had already served with distinction in the deserts of North Africa, the realities of combat in the humid, tropical, and undeveloped Pacific led to many field modifications. Chief among these was the installation of a modified Mark 19 wireless set, alongside a headset and microphone receiver on the rear deck, enabling infantry to communicate with the tank crew during engagements. This was later replaced by a standard infantry phone. Continued operations in New Guinea also revealed that, while the Matilda was virtually immune to the standard 37mm Japanese anti-tank guns at the time, 
lucky hits could still break track idlers and jam turret rings. As the fighting grew more desperate, Japanese soldiers would often suicide charge oncoming vehicles and throw explosives onto the rear deck where they could damage the engine louvers. Immobilized tanks often suffered grim fates, as the Japanese simply lit fires under them to roast the crewmen alive. To compensate for these issues, 2nd 9th Armored Regiment installed improvised grenade screens using pierced steel landing planks supported by frames made from steel tubing over the engine decks. The men of the 1st Armored Regiment and 2nd 4th Armored Regiment, meanwhile, used steel tubing and wire mesh on top of the engine louvers, with additional mesh bent or welded around the sides for support. Track idlers were upgraded with armored steel guards attached via hinged mounts that could be lifted out of the way for maintenance. Finally, the vulnerable turret rings received upgraded protection in the form of a rectangular steel collar welded to the hull and extending around the turret, with an opening at the rear. In January 1944, Lieutenant General Sir Leslie Mooreshead tendered a report emphasizing the value of the Matilda II in jungle operations, deeming it ideally suited for the role of infantry tank, supporting troops during the advance and blasting enemy strongpoints apart with its medium howitzer. The tank also received praise for its compact size, which enabled it to conduct amphibious operations on the standard LCM or landing craft medium rather than the much larger and rarer LCT, or landing craft, tank. This meant that, as the Huon campaign progressed, more Matilda IIs would be rapidly pushed to the front lines. In August 1944, 2nd 4th Armored Regiment launched from Brisbane and landed at Madong. And in November, C Squadron moved out to help the 6th Infantry Division advance towards the Japanese stronghold of Wewak. Meanwhile, B Squadron of 2nd 4th Armored Regiment had been enduring similar experiences on Bougainville Island. After several months of training with the 3rd Australian Infantry Division, the squadron first engaged Japanese forces in a counterattack to rescue two companies that were encircled and under heavy fire. But first, the unfortunate Matildas were forced to wade through miles of jungle mud and ford several rivers, resulting in several vehicles being abandoned. After 24 hours, a much reduced B Squadron finally crawled onto Slater's Knoll and were immediately thrown into battle. Despite their condition, the Matildas were instrumental in turning the tide of the battle, soaking up enemy munitions and suppressing whole platoons of enemy troops. After deftly parrying the Japanese counterattack and rescuing the two trapped companies, tanks from B Squadron advanced southeast towards Bin. Here they encountered heavy resistance, as the cunning Japanese had devised new tactics against the Matilda II. These included repurposing long-range 15cm field artillery as direct-fire AT guns, and converting bombs into high-yield anti-tank mines. They also fooled the Australian magnetic mine detectors by just putting the bombs inside wooden boxes, forcing the infantry to painstakingly sweep the ground by hand before the tanks could rumble forwards. Thanks to these new tactics, the Japanese were able to forestall inevitable defeat in Bougainville until their empire surrendered, with the defenders laying down arms on the 11th of August, 1945. But perhaps the most tenacious enemy on Bougainville was the thick coral mud which could easily build up inside the track housings of a Matilda II and cause mechanical failures. Squadron B solution was a simple mud scraper shaped like a bent capital Y affixed forward of the drive sprocket behind the suspension skirting. As the track turned, the scraper would deflect mud off the inner circumference of the sprocket, preventing the mechanism from seizing up. While Bougainville and New Guinea were both tough challenges for the new Australian Armored Corps, 1945 also saw them engaging in the liberation of Borneo. Borneo held strategically important oil reserves, but was much more notorious for its prison camps, where thousands of allied POWs languished in horrific conditions. This was where the Matilda's ability to fit into smaller landing craft came in most useful, as tanks were deployed along the infantry on both mainland Borneo and the nearby islands of Labuan and Tairaken. Fighting was particularly savage on the island of Tairaken, where Australian tank crews faced their fiercest challenge of the entire war. On May 1st, C Squadron of 2nd 9th Armored Regiment alongside men from 2nd 1st Armored Brigade Reconnaissance Squadron began the laborious process of sweeping the island clean. Their first target was the Ri Pon airfield, but as the Australians advanced on it, they encountered a canal filled with a strange oily substance. 
It turned out that the Japanese had diverted the output of a nearby oil refinery into a moat surrounding the airfield, which ignited in a vast column of flame that drove back the attackers. Even after this burnt out, the tenacious defenders held out until May 5th. Japanese cunning only intensified from this point onwards, and tank crews assaulting the town of Terakan discovered wires snaking down from the high ground, which enemy soldiers used to slide primed 75mm howitzer shells down onto the engine decks of the advancing vehicles. The assault on Point 105 proved the ultimate challenge to the Matilda 2 teams, featuring the heaviest fortifications encountered thus far. The toughest nut was codenamed the Marguet, and required point-blank fire from field artillery and a 3.7-inch AA gun to crack open. But no matter what resistance it faced, the Matilda II continued to excel in its role of bunker buster and assault leader. At one point, an improvised anti-tank mine exploded beneath the Matilda with such force that the 25-ton vehicle was launched 18 feet into the air. Once it landed, the crew emerged shaken and bruised, but otherwise uninjured. While Matilda crews were receiving unexpected flying lessons on Terra Can, 1st Armored Regiment and Specialists from 2nd 1st Armored Brigade Reconnaissance Squadron were assisting 7th Division with the invasion of Balik Papan, which began in July. Yet again, infantry commanders displayed apathy and disinterest in cooperating with armor, leaving the tank crews to come up with their own tactics. These involved formation of 3 gun tanks and 3 of the new Matilda Frog flamethrower tanks. Two guns would advance in line, followed by two flame tanks, with the last two tanks bringing up the rear. The flame tanks would put up close-range pressure on enemy positions, while the gun tanks flanked or provided support in the event of an ambush. River crossings were dealt with with a Covenanter bridge laying vehicle. Balik Papan would be the largest deployment of Australian armor during the war, with 33 AFVs participating in the landings. Like Tea Rakan, Balik Papan featured entrenched opposition. But the new Matilda Frog tanks were very effective at torching bunkers and smoking the Japanese out of their extensive tunnel networks. Though thrown into the thickest fighting around Balik Papan Town, the Matilda teams methodically swept the Vasse Highway and Signal Hill clean of defenders before advancing through the town and port districts. Even so, there were some hiccups. On the 5th of July, an amphibious landing at Penad Jam Airfield resulted in considerable embarrassment when two Matildas buried themselves up to their turret rings in soft beach mud, but were later recovered. Meanwhile, Matilda tanks assaulting the Mangar airfield found themselves seriously threatened by 120mm guns, which could land shots at 1,200 yards distance. All three tanks in the attacking squadron took hits, with two destroyed and one heavily damaged. Menangar airfield would be one of the only places that successfully repelled an attack by Australian armored forces, and the remaining tanks were evacuated by sea. Thanks to seeing deployment against forces that were usually incapable of seriously threatening it, and combined with the fact that it served right until the end of the war, nowadays the majority of surviving Matilda II hulls are of Australian origin. Sadly, most of the working vehicles left over at the Pacific Campaign were not returned to the mainland, and either abandoned or simply dumped at sea. Only a small number were retained for training purposes, and surviving examples can be seen at the Royal Australian Armoured Corps Museum at Pocaponyal, Victoria, which has six, including two two-pounder tanks and one with a three-inch howitzer. Two more non-functioning vehicles with added equipment and a number three dozer tank can be found at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum at Cairns. In the end, the Matilda II in Australian service was arguably the quintessential example of an infantry tank utilized in the precise role its British designers originally intended, albeit in a completely different environment. So what do you think? Was there a better design out there for fighting in the jungle? What ways of countering the Matilda could you think of? And if you're not subscribed already, be sure to do so for future content, such as dedicated videos on the famous flamethrower variant of the Australian Matilda 2, the Frog. Until next time, keep us in your sights.